I have been called a pessimist before, and I can see why that happens. What I contemplate upon and the realizations that emerge from it, and that I try my limited best to translate into words, are not a quick fix for hope, but an outlook on how much reality is a product of our own reflection, including the limitations in our present nature. I understand and respect those who may view my stance as a pessimist. I have realized that although we do need hope, denial of circumstance and confirmation bias will never be a solution. Of course, I am never speaking here from a higher ground, ever. I'm only human, of flesh and bone I'm made, human, born to make mistakes. Yes, this is the chorus of that famous 80s song. Just joking, but it's a fact. I am as limited and as free as any of you, and I consider you all my classmates. I am contemplating with you, never for you. So that brings us to today's subject. There are brilliant individuals around, fellow classmates, that have, almost literally, dug up astonishing information about past architecture that had been partially soil submerged, but mostly only hidden by scholarly illusion. After all, a school of fish act as they are all one. But it is always at the individual level that realization emerges. Historical academic explanations and theses have hidden these incredible structures in plain sight for a significant time now. But as the reflected shadows began to move for victory, so have the collateral contrary effects began to manifest. Shadows who are inebriated by the same pride and shame that we had in their place. After all, I do not label them as reflections for no reason. So, together with the narrowing down imposed on society at all levels, including the level of ideas, a contrary widening effect began to sprout in several different places. This was expected by the shadows up to a point, hence all the presented programmed expectations that we have been given over time, Expect a particular savior, expect aliens, expect dystopia, etc. All these, as was discussed in the previous contemplation named Stories, Myths versus Hoaxes, are hoaxes because they are reliant on details, not on outline. These hoaxes intend to program us into expecting details and to be on the lookout for them, seeking them, and thus finding them because we seek them. A mere example of this, to better illustrate the power of expectation and also how much we produce reality by perception, is if one is looking for a particular number, due to, for instance, an obsession that set in or something of the like one will find that number everywhere. This is not free observation or contemplation, it is filtered perception. And that filter is made up of details. So, expectations do lead to confirmation bias and denial of circumstance. Because what is observed is not closer to what is actually there, the outline, but closer to what is put over it, the details. So, going back to the subject, a lot of brilliant fellow classmates have been observing architecture and mountains and rock shapes and the lights in the sky and so on, and have through contemplation arrived at incredible realizations about them, uncovering facts from that scholarly illusion placed over them. It is at this point when the hidden is revealed that a new temptation emerges in one's mind. If the present world around us is false and evil, then whatever the deceivers have been trying to hide, and that one is able to uncover, can only be the truth. This temptation stems from a reversed psychology manipulation that uses our expectations to frame things into a single duality, good versus evil, truth versus falsehood. 
So framing it like that means that if one discovers something that falsehood and evil have been trying to hide, then one is led to conclude that this something must be true and good. Otherwise, the deceivers wouldn't have tried so hard to hide it. As was contemplated before, falsehood can wear many faces, be them looking evil or looking good, looking false or looking true. The world we experience is sort of a shattered mind, made up of divisions that allow reflections and contrasts of each element to be presented to it, as discussed in the previous contemplation named dream therapy. This means that there is then both a false good and a false evil, whose binding link is falsehood. They are both false. It is like an allegorical dance, a wrestle match, a game, like Apollo dancing or wrestling with the python at Delphi, shown by the Ophiuchus constellation depiction. Imagine a scripted movie. One side of the actors play the good, the other side of the actors play the evil, both reflections of each other. And they reflect each other exactly because they are not true, but because they are both false. That is, both sets of actors are playing a script or program, regardless of being aware of it or not. They are not living. Where is truth then, you may ask now? Truth is, using that same allegory, both in the audience watching the movie, and also in the actors, waiting for them to stop identifying so strongly with the character and role they were set to play. Imagine then the collateral effects on the script that would occur if one day you were watching a movie, even a movie that you have watched several times and know well, and one of the characters suddenly goes off script. And not only that, but he also stops identifying with the character he's supposed to play in the movie. And even further, he also stops identifying with the actor character too. As you can see, approaching truth is like our brilliant classmates uncovering old architecture. It is all about undressing the falsehood identification. This is why so much has been done to push individuals who already were playing characters and roles within a script to identify with a new layer that they can pick from a rainbow of choices and seal that new script layer with pride. So instead of undressing falsehood, they dress over the already existing falsehood with more covering layers. So, as I was saying, the temptation is there to consider that what was uncovered must belong to truth, otherwise it wouldn't have been covered by the deceivers in the first place. It is the duality mind programming at work. However, when one realizes that truth is absolute and timeless, and that is the main quality that distinguishes it from a fact, then one can ask further questions related to the discoveries made. If what was uncovered belongs to truth, then why was it subject to destruction? Truth is indestructible, timeless and independent. No doubt that the discoveries show a higher level of intelligence and craftsmanship than we possess today in the current script, but that does not automatically mean they are truth. In fact, I tend to suspect that what the shadows and deceivers would very much like would be to have that past civilization and technology back. After all, they worship technology as the best means to pretend they are truth. Wasn't it Arthur C. Clarke, one of their most prominent frontmen and idealists, who wrote any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Should one read this as an advice to deity pretenders or as a warning to deity worshippers? Maybe both, 
because one day the deity worshippers may very well find themselves in the place of being deity pretenders, tempted into maintaining order through the same deceit they were subject to, or otherwise choosing to let all the poisons that lurk in the mud hatch out by not caring to pretend anymore, like in Robert Graves' I, Claudius. In any case, what I see uncovered in the old worlds of architecture, that are probably not that old in terms of time measures, is not a true utopia or paradise that was lost. Note that paradise means surrounded by walls, and if the walls are there, be them physical walls or psychological ones, it is certainly because there is a limitation, something to hide and to pretend or to guard. Truth would have no limitations, no walls, nor would it be destroyed. So what I realize upon contemplation of this incredibly advanced technological civilization that is uncovered is not my paradise lost. They, the shadows, who have been trying so hard to bring back and imitate that lost technological civilization with our help, and they even pretend to have technology they did that they don't, simply because they can't recreate it. Those uncovered technologically advanced old worlds are the paradise lost of the deceivers in my view. Maybe they are even attempting to make these brilliant classmates of ours to unwittingly rediscover and tell them how to recreate the old technologies. And by no means am I stating that technology is inherently evil. It is merely a tool, and it is the one who wields it that defines it. However, like in the contemplation The Rings of Power, technology be it a physical manipulation or of psychological construct in nature, is also an ever-present point of temptation towards evil, through the pride of power and the shame of one's condition. So it requires moral choices first and foremost to not feed or create shadows reflected back at its wielders. One of the most basic downfalls is the pride to think one is above and beyond falling for presented temptations and the consequent shame to realize that one isn't. None of us holds higher moral ground. These are, then, the main points where my observation and contemplation diverge from most of the opinions I see from these brilliant individuals who have seen what I didn't. 1. The destroyed civilizations and the destroyers or usurpers of it were both false, regardless if they wore a guise that looked good or evil. 2. If one such civilization would come back, it would not serve those seeking truth, but those seeking false order, which always relies on illusion. And this can be very pleasant to our characters, for a time. 3. Every time the world shrinks, it also shrinks in scope, magnitude, intelligence, and so on. There is a good and true reason for this. The smaller in power and scope something is, the less damage it can do overall, and the less time it takes for its illusions to be uncovered in the end.